Hi, welcome to Volcano Lecture. This is absolutely one of my favorite topics uh, because my like first job in geology was working on volcanoes and uh, I just stayed fascinated with volcanoes for my entire life. And I think part of it is every volcano is unique and amazing and I hope in the lecture today you're going to get a little taste of that. So let's first start with this uh, map of the United States which shows us who needs to be concerned about volcanic hazards in this country. So what we have are, um, this shows historic volcanic activity over the past 10,000 years in the US and the red triangles represent volcanoes. Um, ignore this one, there is not a volcano there, that's a typo. But we have all these volcanoes in the Cascades, uh, also Hawaii, and then in Alaska, the Aleutian Islands there. And we also have these, I like how it says light orange areas. Light orange is the color, also known as yellow. Um, these yellow areas have lower volcanic hazard, the dark orange are higher volcanic hazard, and then these gray areas that you see are places that have uh, a volcanic ash hazard for them. And what you can see from this is uh, pretty much volcanic activity uh, is uh, in the western United States. If you're in the eastern United States, you don't have to worry about that today. And that comes back to plate tectonics uh, and where you tend to get volcanoes. Now, in this lecture, uh, we're going to learn a number of things. Um, this is a movie poster uh, for Lord of the Rings. I hope a lot of you have seen that. It's a kind of fun movie to watch. And uh, we're going to see if, if volcanoes actually look and behave like that. Um, we're going to learn what to do in a volcanic eruption. Right? we got the volcano erupting, and apparently that is time to dance and play your tambourine. Well, actually, we're going to learn what you really should do if there's a volcanic eruption imminent near where you live. Um, we might also learn how to name volcanoes. Uh, I like this. Um, uh, there's a volcano that erupted about 10 years ago, completely uh, screwed up air traffic in Europe, and it's called Eyjafjallajökull. It's in Iceland, and it actually has the name means something. It's like a uh, volcano under a glacier or something like that. Um, but it was really fun to watch all the newscasters try to pronounce that. Now, what we're really going to learn about in this class are, like I said, different volcanoes have different personalities. And some volcanoes are like this one. This is Erta Ale. This is in Ethiopia. It has a permanent lava lake in it. And when I say permanent, uh, that lava lake's been active probably for about 90 years now, at least. Um, and you can uh, walk right up to it. Uh, well, not quite right up to the lava lake, but you can walk up to the edge of the volcano. You can look at the lava lake. Um, in places like Hawaii, uh, when Kilauea was erupting, uh, you could go up to it and make grilled cheese over the lava. These kinds of volcanoes, they have um, eruptions that are relatively, relatively quiet, relatively calm and peaceful. But then there's eruptions that look like this. This is something called a pyroclastic flow, where this giant explosive eruption just races down the side of a, uh, a volcano and um, basically just destroys everything on its path. Um, these pyroclastic flows are what uh, hit Herculaneum and Pompeii when Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD and um, you know killed a number of people in those eruptions. So what we're going to learn about today then are the different kinds of volcanoes they ex that exist, the different kinds of eruptions they have, and why some of those eruptions are pretty safe to be near, relatively quiet, and why some of them are so violent and you don't want to be anywhere near that volcano when it's erupting. And then we'll finish up by uh, looking at how can we forecast volcanic eruptions? What sorts of things do geologists look at? All right, so volcanoes are basically where molten rock is erupted 
out of the ground, right? We get this molten rock that uh, basically either explodes or, or flows out of the ground. So the number one thing we need to figure out is where does this molten rock come from? Okay, liquid rock, when it is underground, is called magma, and once it makes it to Earth's surface, it's called lava. And most of this liquid rock comes from the upper mantle, and that's going to be about 50 to 250 kilometers deep. Now, there are some special lavas and things that can come from deeper than that, but uh, most lavas come from about that range. Now, how do we melt rock? Obviously, not every place on the planet has volcanoes. Volcanoes are only in certain areas. And uh, so this is because you need special conditions in order to create that molten rock. And you can have rock melt. Earth melts rock in three basic ways. A very obvious way is by increasing the temperature. And uh, basically, you increase the temperature on, um, on anything, any substance, eventually you'll get it hot enough that it will melt. And uh, this is in fact what happens at places called mantle plumes. And mantle plumes um, are where we have this uh, extra heat that rises all the way from the core through the mantle and then it hits the crust of the planet and starts melting it and thus uh, melts this rock, creates some magma. And this is why we have volcanoes in places like Hawaii and the Galapagos Islands. There are mantle plumes with this extra heat creating that volcanic activity. <clears throat> now another way that you can um, uh, get rock melting is by decreasing the pressure on it. So there's um, uh, the higher the pressure on a substance, the higher its melting point becomes. So if you have very hot rocks and then you lower the pressure on those very hot rocks, they can start melting with no change in temperature. And this is what happens at rift zones. Remember from the first lecture, a rift zone is where plates are moving away from each other. Where plates move away from each other, the crust gets thinner. If the crust is thinner, that means there's less pressure on the hot mantle underneath, so it will start to melt. And then you can add volatiles. Volatiles for a geologist are things like water vapor and carbon dioxide. And if you add those to hot rocks, they lower the melting temperature of the rocks. This is also called flux melting. And this is common at subduction zones. Now remember, at a subduction zone, you have this ocean plate. If it's the ocean plate, it's been sitting underwater for a long time, so it's got a lot of water in it. And that ocean plate sinks underneath another plate. And so it's going to be taking a bunch of that water with it. And so you add this water to the hot mantle and it lowers the melting temperature and you get uh, magma. This is what happens in places like Japan and the Cascade Mountains here in the United States. You have subduction happening, creating the magma that results in the volcanoes. This is simply a diagram uh, showing each of these situations that I talked about. Basically, uh, on here, we have um, temperature on the x-axis, we have uh, depth on the y-axis, and then on here in red, we have something called the geothermal gradient. And the geothermal gradient is the fact that the deeper we get in the planet, the hotter it gets. And that's what it's showing here. And then on this green line, this green line is the solidus. And the solidus is the melting temperature of the rocks. And if you notice in the normal condition, like what we would have here in Texas, the geothermal gradient, the heat, never gets hot enough to melt the rocks. That's why we don't have any volcanoes here. 
but in places like a rift, which is this mid-ocean ridge, um, we have hotter rocks where there's not as much pressure, right? They're not as deep. So the heat intersects that solidus and we get melting. Or at a mantle plume, things are simply hotter, right? They're just add heat, we get melting. Or over here, this is the subduction zone where we add those volatiles and that reduces the melting temperature. So those are the three basic ways that we get um, our rocks melting in the planet. All right, so when we talk about lava, lava is simply molten rock, but there are different chemical compositions to lava. And the chemical composition of that lava is going to have a big effect on how the volcano behaves when it erupts this lava. So one chemical composition we can have is basalt. This is what geologists call a mafic igneous rock. Mafic comes from uh, the elements magnesium and then ferric, which refers to iron. So mafic means it's a rock that has a lot of iron and magnesium bearing minerals in it. Mafic basalt is black. It's a very dark color to it. It does not have a lot of silica and silica is basically quartz. So you can think of that as quartz in there. So it doesn't have a lot of silica. And when it erupts, it erupts very hot, 1100 to 1250 degrees Celsius. However, some uh, lava flows have been calculated. They've been measured at even hotter that, as much as uh, 1400 degrees Celsius. So that's the basalt. Then we have andesite. Andesite is what we consider an intermediate chemistry. It's going to have a gray color. It's going to have more quartz in it, and it erupts at a lower temperature, 900 to 1100 degrees Celsius. Then we've got something called dacite, which is considered a felsic igneous rock. It tends to be a light gray color, has even more quartz, and erupts at a lower temperature. And then lastly, we have a lava type called rhyolite which is also felsic. By the way, felsic refers to minerals feldspar and silica, and that's because these rocks have lots of feldspar and quartz in them. Uh, rhyolite has lots and lots of this silica in it, and it erupts at, say, 700 to 800 degrees Celsius typically. And that's what some of our different lava compositions chemically um, will look like from this dark basalt to that very light-colored rhyolite. Now, I said that's important to how um, a volcano erupts. Because one of the things that controls the way a volcano erupts is viscosity of lava. And viscosity is a fluid's resistance to flow. If something is considered to have low viscosity, that means it flows easily. Right? It's like water. It just flows really nice and easily. If something has high viscosity, it's very thick and gooey and flows really, really slowly. So since magma or lava is a liquid, it uh, has viscosity. And this viscosity is controlled by two important things. The silica content is one of these things. The more silica you have, the higher the viscosity. And that's because the structure of the silica in, uh, in the magma is something uh, called the silicate tetrahedra. You don't need to know that, but what you do need to know is that these, the silica likes to stick to itself. It likes to bond to itself. So if it has lots and lots of silica in it, it tries to bond to itself so it becomes really gooey and doesn't flow very well. The other thing that controls a lava's viscosity is the temperature. The hotter the lava is, the lower the viscosity is. So hotter lava is going to flow easier. So let's look at our different lava types again, where we have uh, basalt, andesite, dacite, and rhyolite. Well, the lava that's going to have the lowest viscosity, meaning it's going to flow the easiest, will be basalt because it has the highest temperature 
but lowest silica content. The one that's going to be the thickest, gooeyest, stickiest lava that doesn't flow very well will be rhyolite because it erupts at the lowest temperature and has the highest silica content. Now, another piece to how and why volcanoes erupt is the gas content of the magma. All magma contains dissolved gases, which are the volatiles that I was talking about earlier. All lava has that. And sometimes when you see um, lava like this, where the lava rock has all these little holes in it, what that's showing is where the lava cooled around these little gas bubbles. Now, what this has to do with eruptions, though, as magma rises, the pressure on it drops. Okay, so the magma rises, the pressure on it drops. What this does is allow gases to come out of solution. Just like if you open a can of uh, soda, you know, you buy a Coca-Cola, you open it, and you hear that little rush of gases come out, that little like shh, right? Well, what that is, you're lowering the pressure on the carbonated beverage inside and allowing some of those gases to escape. Same thing happens in a volcano. As the lava rises upwards, the gases come out of solution. And that's what we're seeing right here. Down here in the magma chamber underneath the volcano, there's enough pressure to hold the gas in solution. But as that magma rises, the pressure drops, the gases start bubbling out. Now, if those gases can escape easily, then you're going to have a pretty quiet eruption. You'll have things like in Hawaii where you can walk up to the lava and you can kind of look at it and feel its heat and not worry about dying. If the gases can't escape, if they get stuck in the lava, that means their pressure is going to build and build and build even more until it explodes. That's like what happened at Vesuvius when it erupted and buried Pompeii in ancient Roman times. Well, what's this have to do with that viscosity I was just talking about? Well, rhyolite has that really high resistance to flow. It's thick, it's sticky, it's hard for the gases to escape. In basalt, that's low resistance to flow. It's a really runny lava, so the gas can kind of just go out and escape really easily. So that's why, typically, volcanoes that erupt basalt are pretty quiet, not that explosive, but volcanoes that erupt rhyolite tend to be much more violent and more explosive eruptions because those trap the gases inside the volcano until you reach you know, this, this point where the pressure just has built so much that it explodes. All right, so when a volcano erupts, now that we know why volcanoes erupt, right? The key behind a volcanic eruption is the volcanic gases. They are the power behind the volcanic eruption. But when we get a volcanic eruption occur, a number of things come out of the volcano. Most people are most familiar with lava, right? That's kind of the obvious one. Well, this lava is coming out of the volcano. Well, just like lava has different chemistries, we can also look at lava as having different types based on the shape that they get when they erupt. So we're going to take a quick look at some of the different shapes and some of the different behavior lava has as it flows out of the volcano. And um, one of those is something called pahoehoe. Pahoehoe is ropey lava. And I know that's a kind of weird name to it, and uh, it's a weird name um, because it's Hawaiian, and most people aren't so familiar with the Hawaiian language. But, you know, who knows more about volcanoes and what to name things than people who live right on top of one? So Pahoehoe is this ropey lava. You can see it right here. See how the surface of it looks kind of like coiled and braided ropes? That occurs because 
as the lava is flowing, the top of the lava cools faster than the center of the lava. So the top of the lava flow is cooling, the center of the lava flow is still flowing, and it starts wrinkling the surface. And I'm going to show you a video of this in just a moment. So let's take a look at a couple other shapes lava can take when it erupts, and then we'll look at uh, lava in action. All right, another uh, shape that lava can take when it erupts is ah-ah. Uh -uh. This is, again, a Hawaiian term. And ah-ah uh -uh is blocky lava, kind of like this. See how it's all jagged and it's not doesn't have that like surface coils? Here we can see pohoihoi in the front, but some of this jagged ah-ah uh -uh that flowed over top that pohoihoi. The way this forms is you have a slower moving lava flow, and then as, um, as that lava flow is cooling, it contracts, and as it contracts, contracts, it gets smaller, pieces break off it, creating these very jagged, rubbly surfaces to those lava flows. Now, the last kind of shape that I wanted to talk about that lava can take on as it erupts, we can get something called pillow lava created. Pillow lava is where blobs of lava are erupted underwater. So what happens? The lava comes out underwater, the water instantly cools that lava, but more lava is still flowing behind it. So you get kind of this, this piece of lava squeezed out, cooled, and then more squeezes out and cools, and you get these like blobs that look like a stack of pillows piled up. Like what we see here. See, there's one pillow, there's another pillow, here's another one right there. So let's take a look then at some of the lava flowing in action, and we'll get to that in volume two.